And he came back from that thinking, you know, he was deflated and he thought, well, what, what can I do? Okay. Um, the typical American mentality is write a really big check, send it off in the mail and feel a little bit better about yourself. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing. But Jeremy kind of thought a little more holistically, let's join with a group called International Justice Mission who has a very holistic approach to solving this issue of human trafficking, That's not awesome. just putting a Band-Aid on it, yeah. okay? And so he, wanted, he decided, what if we partner with them and do the very thing that we do best, climb which mountains. is climb mountains, and let's raise money by climbing a big nasty mountain called Mount Rainier in Seattle, okay. which is in their backyard, yeah. their Seattle, what are they called, Seattleites. And uh, so everybody there knows the mountain. If somebody's climbing the mountain, they can see it from the city and they're very impressed. That's great. So they chose Mount Rainier. They chose that cause of human trafficking. They chose that organization, International Justice Mission. Wow. And then we pulled a 10-man team together to go climb this mountain and raise awareness as much the, as we can. The website can. to find out a lot more about Climb for Captives is the name, climbforcaptives.com. Uh, we are typically, uh, yeah, based out of Seattle mostly is where most of the guys are. Okay. But it is literally around the world as far as the involvement of people. Uh, our goals this year are very ambitious. It's $40,000. And the reason for that large amount is to fund an entire project that the International Justice Mission will do. They will be able to go in and rescue 18 girls from their slavery currently in Mumbai, India. And it's a very holistic project in the sense that they will also bring about justice to the 34 perpetrators of these crimes and abuses. Wow. Which your typical model, especially in Southeast Asia, is, okay, so these men have gone into a village and lied to, to some family and said, hey, if we, if we can buy your little daughter, right. buy your son, we'll pay you $300. Now well, that might be able to feed a family for a year or more. Right. So that's a big deal and they say, oh, if you're gonna bring them into the city and give them a great education, which I never had, please do so. Okay. So it's a trap and the men will bring them in and then the Westerners will come in and see the horrific forced prostitution they're putting them in and we'll say, okay, I'll pay you $400 and buy her out of the situation. So you're, but, you're stopping the problem where it starts at, at the family side. You think. But the problem is when you write a check to buy back the slave, you're feeding into the problem because the person goes back into the village, buys another person for $300. If you understand the, the parallel here, okay. they're making $100 every time they steal a person from their family. Yeah. So International Justice Mission does a completely different deal. They don't negotiate. They don't go in and buy back humans because that's completely feeding into the slavery issue. Mm -hmm. What they will do is say, Let's strengthen the local government system. Let's strengthen the local court system. So let's go in and conduct a raid with the local law enforcement, which they're doing in Mumbai. Okay. Then they bring them into a court because IJM, International Justice Mission, is big on using the court system and letting it be strengthened in the process. And they will see to a fair trial of all the people involved. They will also make sure that these 18 girls are not thrown back on the street or try to just send off to go find their family again. Right. They'll be put in an aftercare facility where they're cared for. They have a completely crushed spirit when they come out of this situation. Um, it's kind of like a walking dead person. Wow. And it's a very serious deal to have that, their spirit revived. And we do hope that they're not just physically set free from this bondage that they're in, but they are spiritually set free as well. Yeah. And again, that's where the faith element comes in. We're praying for these girls. We're crying. We were on this freaking mountain like, uh, last week, and, and, and many times I'd tear up just walking up the mountain, kicking steps in the snow, thinking about these girls who are in slavery. And somehow, by this awesome miracle, we're doing what we love to do, and it's setting people free on the other side of the world. That's awesome. <laughs> That's enough to wake up with a smile. Yeah, I, that doesn't get any better, man. <laughs> well, you, awesome. you normally have to wake up pretty early to make those peaks. It's true. I mean, you got to get up there before what the clouds roll in. And I've been obsessed with sunrises since I was very young. Not a bad and thing. By the time I was 16, I was getting up at 4, 4.30, 5 a.m. Not every morning, but at least two or three times yeah. a week. I drive up to the Smoky Mountains in my Jeep Wrangler, you know, braving the winds. Usually the top's not working or it's leaking and it's raining, kind of like it is right now. Yeah. And I'd photograph sunrise and then I'd be back to West High School to show up at my classes. You know, my friends have their Starbucks coffee and they're trying to wake up and I'm, I'm going, man, yeah. you should have seen what I saw this morning. Yeah. And so naturally... Are you uh, a coffee drinker? You... I, you know, I'm not. I, right. I don't usually need it. Um, so somebody asked me once, are you a morning person or an evening person? I paused for about 30 seconds and a friend jumped in the conversation and they said, Paul's kind of a every time of the day kind of person. There you go. And so if I yeah. need to sleep, I'll sleep. But otherwise, it's sunrise and I'll shoot till 30 awesome. minutes after sunset. 
and catch a wink and do it again the next now, day. Do you have a photographer uh, that's done some shots outdoors that would you say is your role model? Like, do you have, uh, I guess Ansel Adams would be an example? Or? Right. Uh, I would I would go to one people hadn't heard of as much, uh, but he's very well known. His name was uh, is Galen Rowell. Okay. Uh, Galen died about six years ago in a plane crash. But this was probably the most physically fit nature photographer in the history of nature photography. This guy was one of the best climbers uh, over in uh, Yosemite. He okay. a lot of the, did a lot of first ascents over there. Yeah. Literally, he just grabbed a camera in the mid '70s, started just snapping photos like it was. You know, he didn't know what he was doing. He just started right. snapping pictures. And he sent them in to the big name, National Geographic. They actually talked to him, which that won't happen anymore these days. You can't yeah. just send it in and say, hey, I want to hop on board. Right. But they saw his work, and at the time, nobody was doing that, photographing from a mountain while dangling you know, from a cliff with a camera. So he's getting these, these completely groundbreaking shots. Right. And he continued that throughout his career. He did a lot of the Himalayan peaks. He did a lot with uh, environmental organizations. So he was always about a cause. He's always about a purpose. And as a result, money came in to, to feed the yeah. to feed the passion. Um, but great. he was probably not the all-around best businessman ever. He just he just did his the thing. Passion. He did his his thing that he loved. And uh, and like I said, he died recently, uh, about six years ago now, at age of 60, after summoning another Himalayan peak. But uh, but he would be my role model for that for that reason. He was always about something a little more than just taking pretty pictures. Well, for uh, I think that's about it for today. Paul, right. thanks for coming on. Thank you, Knoxville. I hope you've been. Uh, entertained and blessed by having Paul on the show today. That's right. And uh, go obscure outdoors.